folks. Welcome to week five. Um, we're moving after the early Wittgenstein into Carnap and Quine. So you've got those two readings for this week. Um, quick announcements before I launch. I'm going to be in New, New Mexico the week of February 14th and 16th, so we won't have any class meetings that week. Um, please keep in touch by email. Um, I expect to be connected for the entire conference and keep using the discussion board. I'm so happy with the way the discussions are going. I'm so glad that people are coming up with their own ideas and their own cool examples, so keep it going. Um, so, and in case you are not in the class meetings and you don't know this, I have not yet assigned any weekly papers and it's because the discussions are going so well. So as long as people keep contributing to the discussions, um, you are off the hook for weekly papers. Um, I will eventually switch it up and when I do, I will let you know, um, but I'm really happy with the interaction right now. I think that people are learning from each other. So I wanna keep that going. So I do have stuff posted for you. Um, the readings for this week, um, we are gonna talk about Wittgenstein in class on Tuesday, but then the readings are Carnap and Quine and they're already up. And the readings for the next week, the week that I'll be gone, are Suzanne Langer and then excerpts and commentary on Wittgenstein's investigations. And those are also posted under week six. Um, I wanna encourage people that if you are uh, a logic head, and if you are kind of digging some of the questions in this class, you will love the philosophical investigations, and I would encourage you to read it in full, but I'm certainly not going to require it. I know that you've been buried under readings um, this semester, and I am trying to lighten up starting this week, but if, you, if you're so moved, it's a great read. Okay, um, a few preliminaries before we get into Carnap. Um, I, again, I will talk about this in class today on Tuesday, uh, the 7th, um, but in case you can't make the class, so notice that there's a lot of terminology that Wittgenstein throws around in the Tractatus, and of course I'm not going to cover it all, but some of the anchors that he uses are just you know, some sentences are true and some sentences are false. And you've kind of confronted this already, what with Frege um, and the true and the false, and with Russell trying to analyze what makes certain claims true, claims with definite descriptions and claims with indefinite descriptions, uh, what makes them true and what makes them false. So Wittgenstein is steeped in that tradition, and he's using true and false in the pretty conventional sense of correspondence to reality. At least in the Tractatus, Wittgenstein seems to be the arch correspondence theory of truth, um, right? Language pictures the world because it absolutely maps onto what is out there. There are two other words though that he uses a lot. He uses the word senseless and he uses the word meaningless. And so uh, people do argue, scholars argue about what Wittgenstein means by senseless. So I wanna give you a sense of the debate and a little bit of a, a core of the meaning of the word to hang on to as you do battle with this text. So of course, Frege's sense and reference, um, right, the word senseless is gonna have a history with Frege. Um, so these are expressions that have reference, but they don't have sense. Um, the word in German is Sinn, and it's Frege's word, and it's also the word that Wittgenstein uses. So uh, there's no reason to believe that there's absolutely no connection. German is a rich language. It has lots of different words, and yet they're both using the word Zinn. Um, he goes on, though. Wittgenstein, I think, elaborates. Maybe he's he's um, using Frege more than we realize, but he certainly elaborates on the notion of senseless. And he says that there are two ways to be senseless. He talks a lot in the Tractatus, especially in the technical chapters that I had encouraged you to breeze over unless you're a logic head. Um, there are two ways to be senseless. Pathologies and contradictions are the primary ways to be senseless. And it's because, right, so tautologies are sentences that are always true. Contradictions are sentences that are always false. So the sentence, it is raining or it is not raining, is a tautology but it doesn't tell you anything about the weather, right? So it shows the boundaries of the language. It shows us, right, that sentence shows us how we get to talk about the weather. 
And so it shows us kind of how our thought is structured, how our understanding is structured, how our language is structured. And so by looking at the sentence, you see the form of how we think and speak. And so it is revealed, right, what, what the nature of our universe is. And we cannot actually say it, we just have to see it in the structure of the language according to the Tractarian Wittgenstein. So um, it reveals the boundaries of our epistemic world. And I do put epistemic in there with a question mark because I do think that in the Tractatus, you could easily argue that Wittgenstein's being pretty hardcore metaphysical for all of his dismissal of metaphysics. Um, it does seem like the picture theory of meaning demands that there is a real world out there for language to map onto. Um, again, I suggested last week that you go for the Kantian interpretation. I think that that's probably right. Um, so I'm going to suggest that it's the epistemic world, but it's an arguable point. Okay, there's another way to be senseless, and that is to just speak nonsense. Nonsense in the kind of casual way that we use the term. Um, some sentences just don't encapsulate meaningful propositional content. And this, I think that this is a great example. You wouldn't just walk around saying Socrates is identical because that is nonsense. It doesn't mean anything. It's not bearing any um, semantic content. Um, you might have the urge to correct that sentence and say Socrates is self-identical, but actually, um, if you just take that sentence at face value, it doesn't mean anything at all. So it's nonsense. Um, so he uses that terminology as well. Senseless is to be contrasted with being meaningless. So now meaningless, being meaningless, means that you have uh, no connection to the empirical world or the experienced world or maybe the metaphysical world, right? And so this, this notion of meaninglessness is what drives Wittgenstein to dismiss the traditional subject matter of philosophy. So metaphysical claims, right? Since they're beyond the physical, there's no connection with the empirical world. Claims about how we come to know the world have the actual world, the correspondence world packed into it. And so those are also meaningless. Ethical claims are not empirically uh, corroborable or refutable, so they're meaningless, so on and so on and so on. So most of traditional philosophy is meaningless, including the Tractatus, which is why he throws away the book at the end. Um, philosophy at the end of the Tractatus becomes an activity useful for clarification. We use it to help us do science, and we use it to help us understand how we see the world. But philosophy has no meaningful subject matter and no content. Um, onward. Okay, so at the end of the Tractatus, right, it's, it's a book that comes out, it's Wittgenstein's dissertation, and it has made an impact on the intellectual world. So in response to the system proposed in the Tractatus, uh, there forms the Vienna Circle. Um, three major players are Carnap, Schlick, and Neurath. Uh, these are guys who are very interested in meaning. They're also interested in the unity of science. They're very interested in epistemology, even though we can't talk about it anymore. And so they come together and start meeting to try to solve these current problems in philosophy. And they do take philosophy to be a clarificatory activity. So we're not going to talk about metaphysics at all as we join the Vienna Circle. Um, or if we make a metaphysical claim, it's all very Kantian. It's all um, transcendentally ideal, even though it's empirically real. It's all about our understanding, our structure of understanding, and our structure of experience. Um, so at the end of the Tractatus, um, we have this group. Carnap writes this famous book called The Aufbau. Again, if you're a philosophy of language nerd, I highly recommend it. It's one of my favorite books in the entire world because uh, I'm a dork. So Aufbau means building. And what Carnap is trying to do is blast off from the Tractatus and give us a, a firm and very detailed structure 
as to how we build the world. And of course, it turns out that we build the world with language. So the Alfau is all about constructing a meaningful linguistic system that will fulfill the promise of the Tractatus, give us this magnificent picture theory of meaning, make all of our scientific claims meaningful, and dismiss all of the claims that are not meaningful. I'm going to stop there, scroll through, and head into Carnap's philosophy in the next set.